So this is Ajahn Brahm here from the far western paradise of Perth, Jhana Grove Meditation Center, are giving a little talk, especially for the Buddhist Society of Victoria youth, and especially those uh, who are in years 12 or maybe even years 11, who are sometimes worried because at the end of this year, you will be doing the exams for the university entrance. And sometimes people feel that this is going to define your career. And that if you pass, you'll be happy. If you fail, then you'll be in big trouble. But please never think like that. A long time ago, I uh, saw this poem, which was even written much longer ago from the Chinese poet Sung Po. And I'm going to read it out to you now. And this was written around 1036 to 1101. That's a pretty long time ago. Almost a thousand years ago. And he said, families, when a child is born, want it to be intelligent. I, said Sung Po, through intelligence, having wrecked my whole life, only hope the baby will prove ignorant and stupid. Then he will crowd a tranquil life by becoming a cabinet minister. <laughs> that was Sung Po on the birth of his son. And Sung Po was a very, very intelligent man. But what it says is there's different ways of measuring happiness and success in life. So just because you pass exams, it doesn't mean you are going to be successful. And indeed, it's not whether one passes the exam. It doesn't, it's not whether one fails the exam. As far as I understand, it's how one passes or how one fails. That makes you successful in life and happy. It's just how one deals with some of the difficulties or disappointments or what other people say are great obstacles in life. It's how you deal with it. That shows your real intelligence, what sometimes we call emotional intelligence, what in Buddhism we call wisdom, what we call loving kindness to yourself to be able to open the door of your heart to whatever happens and then make the most of it. And that way, we can have a very peaceful, happy, successful life. So first of all, don't make the goal of passing the exams, or passing them really well, or passing them really, really, really well, as so important. Because if you do, that is where you get stress when you give importance to achievement rather than importance to the way you travel through your life, then you find you're missing, missing what we call the Dharma, the truth. It's not whether you succeed or not, but how you travel. With peace, with happiness, with joy, that is what makes a great person. And of course, and I can talk from experience. Experience of passing all my exams and passing them so well, you ended up in Cambridge University studying one of the toughest of subjects in the whole university, theoretical physics. And even doing all of that, I thought I was so intelligent passing all these exams and getting good grades. And then I went off to to northeast Thailand to stay with, be a monk and stay with Venerable Ajahn Chah. And I soon found out he was far, far more wise than I was. Some of the things he could see and the decisions he made were far in excess of anything which I could do with all of my knowledge with all of my training, with all those exams passed. 
and he, he only finished grade four at primary school. And he was far wiser than I was. And that started me to doubt, you know, all these achievements we, we think are great in life. It's not as if those achievements, you know, aren't are useful. And of course they're useful. And of course all the children listen, listening to me will know the first useful thing they are is they make your parents proud. <laughs> And it makes them happy with you. They give you a bit more leeway in life if you do the right thing and pass exams and stuff like that. But there's more than that. It's more than pleasing others. Because really what your parents would like is you to be happy. You to be uh, content and, and doing good things in this world. You don't need to have great degrees to do good things. And in fact, that was one of the graffiti that sometimes people were intelligent. I remember, them, I remember seeing outside the, it was written on the wall, graffiti on the wall, outside the Senate House, if I think I can locate it correctly, in Cambridge University. And it's just a two line little um, aphorism. Exams, killed by degrees. <laughs> if you understand the meaning of that, do you understand? Yeah, it does mean that people, they work hard to pass the exams rather than they learn for learning's sake, for the pursuit of knowledge, for the interest and for the excitement when you go and see something which is groundbreaking. I remember just the first time when I went up to Cambridge studying physics, theoretical physics, being taken around the old Cavendish laboratory, which is, they moved it to a modern one now. The modern one must be far more um, efficient and more facilities, but the old one, the old Cavendish laboratory in Cambridge, that had, oh, it, it had atmosphere. You'd go down one room and they'd point out that was where Rutherford split the atom. This is where J.J. Thompson discovered the electron. This is where some other professor found out quasars. Down here, they were studying lasers. And all these amazing discoveries were happening in this really old building. And these were people who had the freedom to experiment the freedom to follow their crazy ideas and find that they weren't so crazy after all, but got them Nobel Prizes. That is what motivated me in science when I was a young student. That's what should motivate you, whatever you study in life. It is not just to pay the bills to get a good job. There's more to that. The fascinating uh, uh, exploration of life. And anyway, so in order to do that, some of you will have the opportunity to go to universities, but don't waste your brain just passing exams. See if you can use it more wisely for exploration, to keep the passion, not just the intellect, in your studies. And in order to do that, we do have these things called the end of the year exams. Ah, you have to do that because in education they know no better way. All the educators know it's not the best way, it has so many failings, but it's all they have. So, you're going to have to sit that exam, so what do you do? First of all, don't give it so much importance. Yeah, if you fail, you can always do it again. If you don't do it again, you can always find some other path in life. And I know many, many really successful people, not just an Ajahn Chah, but many others, even like a Richard Branson. He didn't know that he was mathematically dyslexic. And that's why he couldn't even count and add up. But he became a billionaire. There's so many other examples like that. So you are going to be doing that exam, so if you've passed, you fail, well, you do your very best, that's the most you can do. 
It's obvious, isn't it? That's what the word means, to do your best. You can't do more than your best, so give it a try. But in order for you to do even better than you even thought you were possible to do, we have these amazing understandings of how to use the human brain. First of all, worrying. Now think about worrying. What does that actually do? It means at night time you think, you worry, when you're on a bus or on a tram you're worrying, and even when you're with your friends you're just half of the time you're worrying about this exam or that exam. Imagine how much energy that drains from your brain. It means your brain is just tired even before you start the exams because there's so much worry and fear. Because of that, even when I was a student, I developed my um, examination technique. I had meditated about three years at this time. I knew exactly just how my brain worked in so stressful situations like tests and exams. So the first thing I did was to make sure the day before the exam, I rested. I put aside my books. In fact, I remember the weekend before my final exams at Cambridge, I just put all the books in my room and went out just uh, to the north coast of Norfolk. I just you know, did some walking for a couple of days. Just, to, and not any books, just walking in the beautiful sunshine. And what that meant was that I'd relax, I wasn't worried about the exams. It took some real courage to do that. The books weren't there. I'd done all my study, I'd done all the work before. Now's the time to give my brain a break. And recently, I think a few years ago, so not that recent, I was invited by a friend who was a rabbi to give a talk at our local a Jewish high school in Perth. And especially to the year 12s who are in a week or two's time going to do their university entrance exams. So I think they call it the TEE or whatever. And anyway, that I, so what I told them, the day before, 24 hours before, put your books in a safe and lock it up and forget the number and don't do any study at the last minute. Instead, just listen to your favourite music, or see a movie, rest, relax. Because if you do that, your brain just can really unwind and recharge. Obviously, that they didn't know much meditation, so I said, if you can just, you know, just rest, relax, or go for solo walks, but not with other people. Don't replace one thing to think about with another thing to think about. See if you can just empty your mind as much as possible to recharge it. And then in the morning, when you wake up, don't look at your books. Straight up, go to your school, do the exam, see what happens. I love telling that story because this was a Jewish school, not a Buddhist school. It was a Jewish school and the, the principal sent me this letter a few months later. I didn't realise what had happened, whether it was successful my time there. The principal sent me a letter saying, thank you. So that school came top of all the schools in their Year 12 results. The best school in Western Australia. Why did that happen? He said, because we followed your advice. Thank you so much. So I thought that was a wonderful little proof that this actually works. To relax beforehand. Worry, thinking, drains you. Let's use a simile. Imagine, just imagine, that, say, a tennis player, say, Novak Djokovic or something. Suppose that he, before Wimbledon or so the, the Australian Open, suppose he played tennis the night, day before, really hard, and all night was playing tennis, and hardly got asleep, and before the match played tennis. He'd be tired before he went out on the court to play his real match, which is one of the reasons why I mentioned Wimbledon because very close to the Wimbledon tennis courts is the Buddhist temple, it's a Thai temple. And when Novak Djokovic is playing in Wimbledon, that 
he has a house close by, but he walks in the early morning and spends a couple of hours meditating in the gardens at the Buddhist temple. He does that because he knows he needs to relax, to let his mind, his brain recharge. And this is important, that's why he's so successful. So anyway, learning how to recharge the brain. So before they do the exams, rest, relax. I don't mean going out to the nightclub, because that makes you more tense and more um, uh, uncharged. You're tired in the morning. There's maybe a little movie in your, in your room, uh, music, just take it easy. And then when the exam actually starts, just remember that this is just you're doing your best and it, it's not that important whether you succeed or fail. Life doesn't end if you fail. And life is not just an easy path if you, if you um, pass. So instead, just do your very best. And also that after that first exam, in that space between exams, and you probably heard me tell this story before, but I cherish this story because it really helped me pass my exams at Cambridge. After the first exam, I don't know why this was at that particular time in natural sciences, theoretical physics was part of that. An exam on Monday morning, three hours, three hours in the afternoon, the same on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday, six days in a row with no break. That was just crazy, but that's what we did. So anyway, that after the first exam, you're supposed to have some lunch before you went to the second exam in the afternoon. But I decided not to have lunch. I had a big breakfast and I wasn't a monk then. I had a big meal in the evening. And lunchtime was relaxing time. Just finished one exam, another exam coming soon. So I went back to my room and sat on my cushion and meditated for half an hour. My meditation occurred like this. First of all, I started thinking about the morning exam. What had I done? Was it right? Was it wrong? Should I have another bit of explanation? I started worrying about something that I couldn't change. Right or wrong, the examination paper had already been submitted to the examiners. I couldn't change it. So why worry about something which you cannot really improve upon? You cannot have any effect upon. When you've got another exam coming in, a, I don't know, 45 minutes time. So the first thing I did was totally let go of the morning exam. <sighs> and the next thing which came up, the afternoon exam. Ah, should I go and get the books out and do some more studies? Should I do some more what they call revision? And I thought, hang on. In the past, I had noticed everything I looked at an hour before the exam never came up. Revision was just wasting more brain energy. And I was tired. If you'd done a three hour exam in, in quantum theory, then you're tired. So I decided to let go of the future and focus on the present moment, on now. And it's something which I've benefited from for the last 46 years of my monastic life. Now, is where your future is being made. This moment is all the time you ever have. So if I really want to do well in the afternoon exam, I have to forget about it. To be in this moment and find out what I need right now. And so I let go of the future. Simple, basic Buddhist teachings. Let go of the past, which for me was the morning exam. Let go of the future, which was the afternoon exam. And focus in the present. And that was where the mindfulness in this moment, the basic Buddhist meditation, done in between examinations, started showing so many problems, which I hadn't have noticed them 
that would have really made my results would have gone really way down. The first thing which I noticed was the physical problem. And I was shaking. And you know, I never noticed that before I came into this moment. I was so worried about the past or the future. I was not aware of them, this present moment at all and the reality of my own body. It was nothing to be ashamed of. This was high tension. This was university exams. I was told they were important and I believed that. So I was physically shaking. I never thought I was that nervous. It shocked me, humiliated me, but it was there, it was true. You know, once you can see that what's happening, if you've got a headache or a, a, a butt ache or you're shaking, whatever it is, once you can be aware of it, you can find ways of alleviating the problem, lessening its severity. And that's what I did. For the shaking, I just learned how to relax my body. Put my awareness there and find out just how I could take away all that tightness, all that tension, and all the inner fear as well until my body was really relaxed. And how important that was, to be able to have my body recharge, so I became fit and healthy. And just like I'd just woken up early in the morning after a good night's sleep. So my body became really relaxed. And the next thing I noticed, the fourth thing, it was only half an hour I had to meditate. The next thing I noticed was how tired my brain was. Because you know, once the body had been dealt with and was uh, how, uh, satisfied, then my brain became very clear just how tired it was. Just like I had a mobile phone, you've been just using it just constantly, hadn't had a charge to re hadn't had a chance to recharge, and it run out of energy. That's what my brain was like after three hours of quantum theory or. Um, general relativity or something. And of course, if I hadn't have noticed that, if I had done the afternoon exam with a brain so exhausted, it would never have been able to perform to its peak. So I noticed my tired brain. I just stayed there, peacefully, allowing the energy to return. And that's one of the things I've often noticed about the way that Buddhists can do meditation. You learn how to be so still, so inactive, that you don't waste any energy at all, which allows the natural recharging of your brain to come on super fast. Five minutes, ten minutes, and my brain was really charged and energized and bright. And that's when I came out of my meditation with a relaxed body and a charged up brain, ready to do the afternoon exams. I never knew at the time that my friends, the people also doing those exams, they looked at me they didn't say at the time, they only told me afterwards. They said I was the only student at that time, the final examinations, who went into the room with a smile on his face. I was smiling, but everyone else was just so tight and tense. And they thought I was cheating. Of course, I wasn't cheating. I just used some open methods to learn how to relax my body, energize my brain, not to worry, be peaceful, and to be so aware in this moment that I did so well in the afternoon examinations. This is how we do well. This is how we surpass other people's expectations. It is how you can do your uh, end of year 12 examinations, going into the room with a smile on your face. You know, when people just prepare for their examinations, they just keep reading, keep studying, 
they keep trying to remember. But we forget about using our, our other means to make our brain become uh, strong at that particular time. And one of the other things which I always recall, the examination time, is that sometimes when we force too much, especially when you're trying to find a solution to a problem, trying to find a, an answer which you know but you just can't get. The harder you force, the more you block the answer from coming up. You know, sometimes I remember during examinations, you'd just be answering a question or, or doing a problem solving or writing some sort of essay and then suddenly you just you know the answer but you can't remember it. I think you understand what I mean. And so that point, I just learn how to relax to the max. I put my attention to something else. Even if, you know, because I'm a meditator, I just will close my eyes and just become peaceful. When I was meditating while I was, a while I was a student. Or if you just want to think of a song, or think of something just to distract you on purpose, just for 30 seconds or a minute. And then when you come back to the paper, the answer's there. So if you know just how to overcome some of the blockages in the human brain, so you can not get, if you get really scared and anxious while you're doing the, the paper, then of course that anxiety will stop the answers from coming. I don't know why people do get anxious. Well, I already mentioned one reason is because we think it's so important. So see if you can look at the examinations as not the be all and end all in life. Look at them as like playing a game of tennis or a game of football with your friends. You try to do the very best when you're playing the game of football with your friends, but the joy of the game is more important. And it's the joy of testing yourself rather than uh, having to compete. I think that attitude, the joy of, of doing an exam, of just seeing how, how well you can do, but not making it just such an important thing in your life, that will change and you can enjoy and have fun in the exam. And even I must say that I was, as I teach, so I behave. So even when I was a school teacher for one year, just before I became a monk, I had to set a mathematic exam for the end of the year. It was only for, I think maybe, well, the equivalent of grade nine or 10 or something, probably grade, grade 10, I think. And so I put a joke in the maths paper he says, that's on drama, okay, I tell jokes because I like to laugh at life. And <laughs> the joke I put in there, I put it in there, but the maths exam, because it was my first exam I'd ever set, it had to go through the principal. And the principal, and he was my employer, my boss. So he asked me to come into the office and I thought I was in big trouble now. I was a teacher, but I can still get in big trouble with your boss. And he said, well done. He said, good joke. And I'm going to include it. So I thought it was going to be taken out. But the principal was wise enough to know a little joke like that at the very beginning of the exam would actually relax all the students. And it worked. Students did very good at that exam. And also, I remember because I had to be the teacher was watching all these students to make sure they didn't teach. And as I told them at the beginning of the exam, open up your exam paper and have a look. And read it, and you've got sort of an hour and a half or two hours. And I remember each one of those students reading the exam paper, they were so nervous. They were so, their anxiety was written all over their face. And then it came to the joke. And you could see them being shocked and looked up at me, and there was a math teacher with a big smile on his face, and they smiled back, and they relaxed. 
And I, I say that that really helped them do well in that particular exam. I don't think you'll get any jokes in your exam papers for that level of uh, school, the year 12 final examinations, but nevertheless, remember, that's how you should take the examination. And during that examination, if you want to just close your eyes beforehand or afterwards to do a little meditation, just on the present moment awareness, so I'm going to lead you in a five minute present moment awareness meditation. So just where you are, it's only five minutes, not that long. As you're sitting down, closing your eyes, just feeling your body. Because feelings in the body only occur now. They bring your mind into the present moment, sort of. You can feel your body. Now imagine, just imagine you've been to the shops and you're carrying these two heavy bags, one in the left hand, one in the right hand, and they really are heavy. And you've been carrying them a long time. So the left arm and the right arm are hurting. And you look at the left arm and the bag in the left hand and you see that that bag is so full on the outside is the name. You usually have the name of the shop on the outside of the bag, but this has got a different name. It's got the four letters, P-A-S-T. It's your past. And you've been carrying that around. And that makes your arms and your hands hurt. You look in the right hand, that bag, which is also full, has the letters F-U-T-U-R-E, your future. That's really heavy as well. And you've been carrying them for such a long time that your right arm is also tired. I think you understand the simile. The past, when you carry around for too long, what happened in the previous exams, all the stuff which you promised or where you succeeded, where you failed. You keep carrying that around and it makes your brain tired. And the bag in the right hand, the future, all your expectations, what you think you should be able to do in the exam, what you want to do afterwards, the career you want to follow, all your plans and fears of the future. You carry that around and that also just exhaust you. So then you just visualize a bag in your left hand, the past, your past, and you imagine leaning to the left so you can lower the bag in your left hand to the floor. When it meets the ground, all the weight disappears. That allows you to move your hand away from the handle. Straighten your back so your left hand and arm can relax by your side. You can re-energize. And the bag in the right hand, the future, you lean to the right. So that allows you to lower the bag in the right hand, the future, to the ground. And that meets the floor. All the burden disappears. And you can unclasp your hand your right hand, move your right arm to your side so that can relax as well. That little visual exercise helps you let go of all the past and all the future. So you can relax, re-energize, recuperate. And then you look down, those two bags representing your past and your future. No one will take them away. You just put them down to rest for a while. And between those two bags, that's you. You standing in this wonderful place of rest and peace called the present moment. 
stay like that for as long as you can. Only afterwards, when you're ready, when you have to, pick up the left bag, pick up the right bag. You find that because your arms have rested, they're not so heavy anymore. So when you rest, either in the space between exams or before exams, it's about re-energizing. And putting down those two bags is a very skillful way of doing it. May you all be happy and well. Whatever you do in life, to be successful, simply because you know how to be happy and how to share that happiness with others. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Yes. All the best. <laughs>